All right, and here we are for episode two, the true episode two. The, the true episode two. <laughs> that, that first one, it, it, it doesn't count. <laughs> Business on Cato Nimordia. It doesn't, it doesn't count. Um, so this week, we decided that we were going to talk about um, more political ideas, um, maybe not necessarily the current political climate, say, in the United States or Canada or around the world, but we would like to talk about the systems as they stand and our opinions on things like republicanism or um, democracy. We might even dribble into a little bit of um, the economic sphere as well and uh, more metaphysical ideas like freedom and equality and things like that. But the main topic, I believe, is that we're sticking on uh, the government itself. Um, but once again, we have another great topic, and I think uh, we're at least going to enjoy having this conversation. So <laughs> As we always I, do. <laughs> I think that's all that matters. <laughs> um, as I said um, in a post, I'm going to focus on my end a little bit more on the revolt of the masses by Jose Ortega y Gasset. Um, I've read through his book several times, <clears throat> and um, I have like a twenty-page essay. Um, it's it's more of like a chapter by chapter um, series of essays. Um, but alongside um, y Gasset, I have other authors: uh, Spengler, um, Guy Debord, uh, Patrick Brantlinger, and Guillaume Fay. Um, which, once I bring them up, I'll mention their books and whatnot. Um, but I think all of these authors and their books uh, that I'll talk about in particular are um, most influential in my ideology, or at least my political opinion. Um, I can honestly say that Jose Ortega y Gasset, when I received this book from a professor, um, well, a proctor, if you will. <laughs> he was the English composition proctor in uh, my college class. And so he gave me this book because I had written something about democracy. And he... Yeah, it was for a conversation <clears throat> we were having, actually. Because I, I remember yeah. you bringing it, up, bringing it up to me. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting book. Yeah, so I'm really thankful that he gave this book to me. I don't think I would have ever heard... I mean, and this is really what started, like, my like insatiable appetite for uh, reading um, more obscure 20th century authors. So <clears throat> I have to clear my throat or else this is going to be a bitch. <laughs> um, but yeah, so without, I'll just call him Mr. Wayne. <laughs> without him, I probably would never have uh, had a stack of books as large as the one beside me is because... Yeah, you have realistically a mountain of, of reading material over there. <laughs> 452 is, <laughs> is what the the spreadsheet says now, that I have 452 books. He's got them out, sorting them alphabetically, and they're all stacked. And, I mean, it's at least four feet tall and <laughs> probably three feet, three feet by, what, another four feet? Yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> It's a quarter of a cord of wood, <laughs> if you will. All burnable, <laughs> but not the... Uh -oh. uh, not Nazis the... are getting excited. <laughs> Burning books. Oh, a lot of them have to do with... Um, well, a lot of them are German authors, to be honest, but um, in, in that case, we're talking about Kant and Schopenhauer and Spengler and uh, maybe some memoirs from the World Wars. So we've definitely got a, a lot of material to go off of here so there should be plenty, yeah. <laughs> plenty of material for us to cover i mean unrelated i have a book by alex trebek his uh autobiography what a great man yeah i miss him <laughs> but without any further ado <laughs> let's get into our political episode here so, so i'm gonna start today um we're kind of alternating in terms of where the topics are going this is something i had thought about before and obviously we have talked about before um, but the topic I want to steer us in the direction of today is more of democracy just as a system not necessarily what we find ourselves in here in the U.S. obviously we're going to touch on that we're probably going to talk about it a lot uh, but I want to talk more about democracy as a system and freedom 
the question, what is freedom? I mean, what does that even mean? And we should have some pretty interesting stuff today. So I'll just go ahead and start. So the direction I'm going is democracy is a really new system. If you think about the different political systems and ideologies that, that people have had in the past for thousands of years, democracy is something that doesn't really happen all that often. You have times in history where people will have debates or they'll have more of a democratic way of thinking of, oh, delegating decisions and authority. But ultimately, those systems will crumble and they'll turn into more authoritarian systems. And this is the first time in history where we've had, for a long period of time, I would say, you know, three, four hundred years of what we could call modern Western democracy, and then only 100, 150 years of modern, modern Western democracy. This is new. It's something new. We've never seen this. And democracy, the root of it is rule by the people. We all know that. We're all taught that in, in grade school. But my take on it is that it really isn't. It isn't really a rule by the people when we think of modern democracy. It, it's When I talk about it, I, I'm going to talk about more of the plant that comes from the root of democracy. So I think of it more of as democracy by proxy. So it's not a real rule by the people because you and I, sure, we get a vote, but how much does that vote really matter? We elect representatives to make decisions in our behalf. So modern Western democracy is a rule, is ruled by a group of people who we delegate authority to. You could call that an oligarchy, sure. But it's evolved past that. It's not even so much a republic like the United States was formed. It's more of a rule by an even greater few, an even wealthier few. It's an oligarchy, essentially. But this oligarchy rules under the guise of democracy involving our voices which are uninformed and obscured we have we give uninformed and obscured consent to certain people who rule on our behalf and rarely is it in our interest because that's how people work corruption is a thing and like i said this is new but it's falling into old patterns so I already touched on us electing representatives because fundamentally people, the masses, aren't capable of ruling themselves. There has to be a ruling class, but the problem lies in when that ruling class doesn't serve the interests of its subjects. You know, in feudalistic medieval Europe, sure, kings, princes, queens, whatever, they would wield their power pretty much unchecked, but they only held power insofar as the people that they served were protected and could pay them taxes and what have you. It was a quid pro quo in a way. But now we've gotten to a point where there really is no quid pro quo. We don't demand much at all. We demand what we think we want, and these politicians will promise to deliver on it, but really they get elected and not much changes. They don't need to. Because we are in a comfortable society, we're comfortable enough to where having the illusion of choice is all that we really need. So then they can rule us from behind closed doors, and we don't put much of a fuss up about it. And as this progresses, it gets more and more and more... I don't want to say totalitarian, because that has a, a connotation, but that's the only way that I can think about it. Their, their power becomes greater and greater. The interests become more and more specific. And so our interests are placed further and further back on the back burner. Andrew Jackson coined the term money power back in the 1830s with his fight with uh, the whole question of a national bank. Uh, that's something that we'll definitely probably touch on. But he coined the term money power because he felt that it was too dangerous to have one central authority have complete speculative control over the entire United States economy. And he was proven correct in that this is a dangerous accident. This is a, a dangerous precedent because... When you leave too much power in the hands of too few of people, naturally, because humans are selfish, 
they will use that power to benefit themselves. They will use that power to benefit them, their, their allies, their interests, and if they're politicians, they'll get their, their power from the people that vote for them. When they're in power, they're going to serve the interests that actually pay them, that actually make their lives difficult. So there, there has always been and will always be a relationship between money and power. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be. But what has to change or what is problematic in the current state of what we call democracy is the degree to which we turn a blind eye to it. So just to be clear here, the new form of democracy that we live in is an oligarchy. It is a money, power, oligarchy, plain and simple. It's a veil of democracy that is just to maintain the status quo and any divisions or strife that we have is internal and it's either a deliberate distraction to keep us from trying to change the status quo or it's just something that naturally happens and it happens to serve their interests. So whereas before there was typically more of a unity between the natural oligarchy, the natural ruling class, and the commoners. Now obviously you would have revolutions, people would overthrow their governments, and then they would replace them with ones that were more akin to their own interests. That's a natural process that has happened time and time again, but we're getting to a point where we can't even overthrow or change or impede the Kafkaesque bureaucracy that is just laying down on us. We're being leaned on by these special interests, and we put no fuss about it because our lives are comfortable. So I have a quote that I'm going to read. I won't say who it is from. I'll let you guys discover that. But here's the quote. It is a very noteworthy fact that the herd instinct leads to mutual support only as long as common danger makes this seem useful or inevitable. The same pack of wolves, which has just fallen on its prey together, disintegrates when hunger abates into its individual beasts. So, essentially, this, this author was saying, wolves, when they attack their prey, they attack together. They're strongest when they're together, but as soon as all of their needs have to be met, there is no threat anymore, then their hunger overcomes their ability to work together. And fundamentally, I think this is a reality that affects us day to day. Because our interests are no longer being served, there is no, there is no external threat or external source of unity in our day to day lives. If anything, we're more divided than we've ever been in the United States, in the Western world in general, I mean, there are arguments over what direction humanity should go, the climate, all kinds of different things that we can argue about. Me just saying those words immediately is going to spark probably some fire inside of you on your opinion about something. So, we're all hungry wolves. There's no prey to go after. So, where do we go? Hmm. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where we go. Because the fact that we're hungry is exactly why we're quiet, docile. Well, I think if, if we look at what you just said and take it in reverse, right? We're hungry. Why are we hungry? Right? It's the bureaucratic systems, you mm -hmm. know, that you just mentioned are mm -hmm. predicated on keeping us hungry. But why do we keep calling these things systems like they're some far off? being you know we call it like oh the government or oh right. the democracy or you know like no there are actual people right that that run these things that do these things right and you talked about illusion of choice i also believe that there's an illusion of interests where we think oh these interests are all competing for one another right. and that these companies are competing and i i think it was brilliantly said by i want to say dan carlin but I don't it think could it could be. Yeah. I, I think he mentioned, and I may have mentioned this last week too, where um, he was saying like all of these people went to school together. They were in the same fraternities. Yes. It's, they, it doesn't have to necessarily be a dark suit, dark room, locked door conspiracy, right. but it is at least like, Hey, we're all running an oil business. We're eventually going to meet because we're the heads of these two, right. you know, 
corporations, right? And so their interests are of the same thing. There is an illusion of competition in our minds. We yes. think, we think, oh, I'm going to go shop here instead of here. Right. Or I'm going to watch this news station instead of this news station. Right. And they're both owned by the same overarching corporation. Right. I mean, how many people know that Facebook, that has been in so much controversy over the years for suppression of information, right? right. They also own, like, the Meta, right? Mm. Meta owns Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. Right. Uh, I think there's another system that they own. I, I want to say Telegram, but I'm not quite sure. I, I don't know what that one. Yeah, but, like... Nobody really thinks about that. Mm. And they're like, oh, go after Facebook, go after Facebook. And it's like, well, Instagram was doing the same thing. Mm. And so you have to think, like, why are they targeting certain users, right? And right. That's like a whole other question. I'm just bringing that up. But I'm working backwards. You know, you, you were talking about how they're keeping us hungry. It's this bureaucratic system. This bureaucratic system right. exists because they are the heads of corporations. Why do I bring up corporations when I'm talking about the government? <laughs> well, exactly what we were talking about. Funny enough, um, it's common knowledge at this point. There's a thing called a lobbyist. Mm. What they do is they donate to campaigns and, hey, we'll donate to your campaign if you support XYZ. Right? So if you support fracking, say this is, you know, gas company A, if you support fracking, we will donate X amount to your thing. Okay. Politicians absorbing that money into their career mm. is is great. It actually it, it does things for them, right? It's good it for helps that individual. Them increase their reach. Right. All that they want is a greater reach because they can't yes. go anywhere without voters. Right. And so what do they do with the voters? Well, as I said, they're keeping us hungry, effectively keeping us on a treadmill, dangling yes. whatever we want in front of us. And so that's why when we get into the election cycle, um, a lot of um, political points are brought up that n you normally wouldn't hear about. But these pollsters, they go through and they ask, well, you know, what's important to you? And they give that information to their politicians, mm -hmm. right? And, whomever they're to whomever they're informing and that's what their campaign is based off of so it's not even like there's a real choice those are all illusions of choices mm -hmm. we're almost forced to worry about those things because you don't know who the cameraman is you don't know why you're being made to see these things right. you don't know really anything other than what they're telling you and their goal on these news stations and television and then you know a lot of what you hear about politics comes through the news you're not necessarily hearing the politicians right. speak and you're not less necessarily reading the, <laughs> the legislations right. that come out um what the news is trying to do through their own bias is try to in, elicit an emotional response rather than a rational one and so when they do this they get you to go out and act be it on your feet or, you know, Pokemon, go to the polls. <laughs> you know, like they, they say that because they think that's what you're interested in. They right. say very strange things to get you to go out and vote. And I find it very strange to this day that we pay these people to represent us, right? So it, it's almost like, hey, I don't really want to go vote on a daily basis. Mm. So I'm going to pay you to represent me. And once they have that money, they don't really care. No, because you know, all of it, the incentive for <laughs> all of the incentive to do what they're even doing, they get once they have the money, because fundamentally that's what they're doing it for is money and power. Right. And so they, they get this money and they kind of vote against your interests. And it's all these backdoor deals across mm -hmm. the aisle and things like that, because, oh, if you vote on this bill, I'll vote on this bill. Right. You know, and it's Christmas so treat. right. And I very much liked what you said at the beginning where you go, well, we're talking about democracy and it's kind of new because it doesn't happen very often. Well, at least in most of the Western countries, I can particularly think of Germany and the UK, Canada, mm. and the United States and Australia and yeah. New Zealand, right? 
yeah, democracy doesn't happen very often. In fact, it right. only happens every couple of years <laughs> because the people, you know, and of course, like in the United States, we're a republic. And in, um, you know, in the Commonwealth countries, in the Anglosphere, mm. right, they're, they're not necessarily republics. Um, but they have a parliamentary system that's very similar to our um, senatorial system. Right. I, I don't even know if senatorial sounds right. <laughs> but they're, they're very similar. And so these representatives, they show up and they, they vote on legislation uh, in, in the name of their constituents. But realistically, we have no say on a daily basis. So... I'm going to say this, and this is a very common Republican talking point. In the U.S., we are not a democracy. We do not use democracy, right. except for in some of the most major elections, which even then, it's bottlenecked into... The, they your, have the electoral college. Yeah, your electoral the college. Sort of things that are supposed... To, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, democracy doesn't happen very often. And so... I, a lot of people on the left I see are saying is, well, this isn't real democracy. We want real democracy. I personally would be terrified <laughs> of a true, real democracy. Not because I trust these elites that we were just ragging on for mm -hmm. the last 10 or 20 minutes, but because I'm more terrified that these people that have been misled by these elites for, I mean, I'm not... I'll go as far to say since 1776, people that have been misled by elites yes. for that long now think interest. that they are the avatar of real democracy, that they right. will usher in this utopia of right. if everyone votes. And so I, I wrote this down. Um, this is from Spangler about how democracy will end, right? And this is, of course, my idea of what Spengler was saying. So mm -hmm. I, I don't have Your his exact away. quote, yeah, right? But this is how democracy will end, right? Number one, the assumption of equality and equity in perpetuity will lead groups to pull the system towards their own ends, right? And so that you have interest groups. Mm -hmm. That's naturally happening already. We, right. we talked about that both in the corporate sphere of influence and in the populous, right. if you will. And this is, especially in our liberal Western democracies where we're bringing in people from all over the world, those people will pull the system towards their own ends and their own ends are expressing their foreign ideas, right. which is not to say that so all of their ideas are just inherently bad. It's just their general presuppositions of the world differ from an Englishman's or a, a German's or a Frenchman, right. you know, it, that, that's just how it is. It's because they don't have the cultural presuppositions, you know, they're, they're being brought in. And because in a liberal Western, a Western liberal democracy, rather, um, you don't really have to assimilate. That's right. not, that's not, uh, uh, a central tenet. Right, right. I would say, I would see even going off of that, particularly in the United States, we were founded on the idea of freedom, of doing whatever you want, going your own way, within reason, obviously, but right, going right. your own way, forging your own path, and the freedom and ability to do so. So when you have this, this idea that we're founded upon, and then also the natural human tendency to like Spangler was saying, I'm going to pull everything in my direction if I can. You, right. it's it's a it's a two way street to nowhere. Essentially, you have a group of people. You have multiple groups of people that feel empowered in their own existence in their country to do whatever they can to benefit themselves at the cost of others, if need be. Whereas in other countries, like in in more European countries, they have evolved more gradually toward democracy, kind of at our at our following. Um, 
Well, with but our they dollar. Came, yeah, yes, <laughs> with our dollar with in our, our dollar. pocket. Yeah. But they, they evolved to have their own brand of democracy, which is contextually different from ours. Because right. ours, at the onset, was do whatever you want, separate from an external authority. Whereas European countries have evolved from central authority at all costs, and gradually they've loosened from that. And so that's right. why in European countries they're a little bit more... I don't want to say unified, but that's the only word there is to use. They're a little bit more unified when it comes to national issues. Whereas with the United States, unless there's a war, you're pretty hard-pressed to find people right. unanimous on something. Yeah, I find that funny because, like you were saying, the, the European countries are breaking down a lot of the authoritarian aspects. Right. Right, and it's not to say that authoritarian is evil all the time, oh, everywhere, no. right? But it's funny that you say that because then the exact opposite things happen, right? Mm-hmm. You have the, the you know, uh, very draconian lockdowns Yes. Uh, for the disease, which name we will not mention. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, like... Yeah, I I feel that you are onto something there when you say that they're more unified on national issues. Um, I got to observe the German election in 2017, and I found it very very strange that when they go to vote, there are two bubbles on their ballot that they have to fill. Just two. There are no more. They vote for who controls uh, the federal and who controls the state, mm-hmm. right, or the Bundesstaat, but. Same thing, state. Um, the two bubbles that they fill are not for a particular candidate. Mm-hmm. They only fill in the bubbles of what party they want to rule mm-hmm. federally and what party they want to rule statewide. Statewise. I mean, of course, I'm sure they do votes for like the mayor and mm-hmm. things like that of the cities. I didn't get to observe that. I only got to uh, observe like the Bundeswahl, state and federal. Election. Yeah, that that was the federal election. And uh, that seemed to me to be like, at the time, I was thinking, how anti-democratic of them. (laughs) But then I look at our system and we just do the same thing, but with so many extra steps. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, we vote for that candidate's name, but really what we're just doing is telling our representatives that we elected a couple years ago. Yes, yes. Yes. To vote yeah, right there. towards that party's right. end. Because the the Electoral College, because we have this strange winner-takes-all mm-hmm. type thing in, in most states. I think there's two that split their votes, and they're in the Midwest, Nebraska, and maybe Iowa. That split I, know, their I know Nebraska votes. is the first one. I don't know what the other one is. Okay. And Georgia. Georgia has runoff elections, which are really strange. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but besides those few... Um, exceptions generally speaking it's a winner take all so you could have a republican that has to throw his ballot towards a democrat right. which is like <laughs> at, at that point you realize that it doesn't matter who's running all that matters is like the party's talking points right and it's, so that that's what we were getting at but uh, trying to bring it back into the, the spanglerian how democracy will end Interest groups are uh, pulling the system towards their own ends, so they'll express foreign ideas and interests. Um, and by foreign, I don't mean that they're, like, because, say, they're from, um, well, I guess the, the majority of the issues right now that we're talking about in terms of immigration are um, uh, Mexican and particularly Central American um, illegal immigrants, right? They're gonna They're not pulling the system towards their foreign ideas as in like they're going to worship their own right. country of origin they're just going to pull it in towards their own people that right. are here in the states right they're and gonna... they're encouraged to do so right as well, right by and... our, our culture right and so when they start pulling the system towards their own i'm talking about the full system i'm talking about the economy and politics mm-hmm. and things because um revolt of the masses or Ortega y Gasset, he mentions that when the masses arrive at complete social power in a liberal democracy, they have political power. Mm. And so 
the root of all politics is social influence and manipulation. Yes. And, I mean, we, we've already covered bases on that. It's intellectual, moral, economic, and religious power. That's what social power is. Because without social power, you're not forming these things, mm-hmm. right? And so they're going to start pulling things to their own ends. Um, energy consumption will skyrocket due to population growth because a lot of times... Um, Poor people will move and they'll start reproducing more. And that's not to bash on poor people. I mean, my ancestors, when they came over, they started reproducing, you know, <laughs> like it's just a normal thing. But when you're talking about these foreign influences in particular, I mean, they're already increasing the population, which I'm a more, I'm more of a mercantilist. I believe that there's a finite amount of resources. Mm-hmm. No matter how many dollars you print, there is a finite amount of value behind those dollars. Right. I mean, it's a finite <clears throat> Right. And so you're going to get a population growth and rise in the amount of poor people because that wealth really just can't go around. And I I think we're starting to see that with this inflation. And I'm not saying it's only due to immigration. I'm just... It's a prime example. It it is a very prime example because a lot of resources are going into either their welcoming or their expelliation. Expulsion? Expulsion. 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 Thank you. (laughs) I'm like sitting here reading Harry Potter in my brain. Expelliation. (laughs) Um, No, they're expulsion. Like, or just the systems that are in place to help them. Mm. And, yeah, that's going to be a serious rise in poor people because giving a man a fish will keep him poor. Right. And so poor countries... they want that. Right. And in these poor countries, even... Even the poor countries that we're sending money to, you know, elsewhere, that it might not necessarily mean immigrants, but we're sending money into Africa and South America and Asia, right? And this energy consumption is going to take place, right? We've already reached peak oil, you know, Mm -hmm. I think that was like in 2018. Like, we're not producing as much oil as we were in 2017, right? Right. And so these poorer countries that we are constantly making poorer, right? Right. They can't afford the clean burns. And so when they can't afford clean burns, they're going to continue using what we would consider to be dirty, right? And so this is going to rough up the economy because the rise in poor means that they consume more. Right. Right. And so a rough economy, you're going to see people start blaming banks. They're going to blame foreigners, which it sounds like we have been. (laughs) But the left, they're going to blame the banks, Right. And the right wing, they're going to they're going to start blaming foreigners or foreign governments. Right. Well, the Democrats did this. They blamed um, Putin, Putin's price hikes, Putin's this and that. Very interesting how they right. were able to do that. It Go really on. doesn't Go matter ahead. what side of politics you fall on, because if you're blaming the banks as a leftist, you're just blaming the institutions of the banks as like greedy mm-hmm. capitalist monopoly guys. If you're on the right wing and you start blaming banks, you're mainly talking about Jews. <laughs> right it's true it if you're if you're left wing and you start blaming foreigners you're blaming the the rich european countries for exploiting somebody right because they're the foreigners in right. your exploiting, country exploiting the poor africans that you know mint their coin and extract all of their precious metals and right invest in their their massive public works projects and then demand the debt back right and if you're a right winger and you start blaming foreigners you're you're in particular blaming illegal immigrants and there's just xenophobic in general right and then <laughs> if you're if you're trump and you blame foreign governments it's china and like unfair uh treaties and things like that right mm-hmm. it's a trade war but if you're biden and you blame a foreign government it's because they're a warmonger they're uh mm-hmm. you know x y and z they're literally putin <laughs> right well and i I, think... I refuse to say hitler on this podcast so you're literally putin <laughs> <laughs> it goes it goes back to my point that i made earlier that yeah i i think actually both of us touched on it but You were pointing out the differences between if you say, if you blame the banks on the left, it means this. And if you blame the banks, blame the banks on the right, it means this. It all depends on the frame. And it goes to what we were saying about the politicians will say what they need to do to maintain their power. Right. Based on what they believe their base will 
yeah. put them into office on. Their entire platform is based off of an ideologue of, well, no, you have to put on your Republican glasses or you have to put on your... Right. You know, and I, I remember I got that phrase specifically from actually a creation fundamentalist. Mm-hmm. His name's Ken Ham. He's an Australian. <laughs> but he, he, would, he would sit there and he'd go, all right, well, what is the science actually saying? Well, here we have to put on our um, biblical glasses. And right. you're sitting there going... So you have to put on a bias in order to look at something. Exactly. And that's exactly what happens. I'm talking about social power. People have social power, right? And they will use that. And so when these people use their social power, they, they look through it at a certain lens. And that's, I mean, politicians are notorious for doing that. If banks and foreigners and foreign governments and all these things, if we could just blame them at the same time and realize that we're all talking about the same thing i think we would get a lot further but Mm -hmm. you're red or blue and that's that's a big issue in democracy is because in democracy we're all talking about the same thing Mm -hmm. but we have no single person like trying to guide the conversation it's just kind of a two people are arguing about agreeing with each other hungry wolves yeah well have you ever had that instance where you're basically arguing with someone yeah but you're actually both agreeing thing. it's because you don't have the same vocabulary right and that's like that's one the thing the finer details become the the confusion right I, it, you and i have done that we've had a conversation where we've generally agreed on the conclusion but how we get there is different right right so when all these things start happening right when people start blaming different aspects of the same thing they're going to simply just abandon democracy and return to their own... Well, I, I don't want to say traditions, because it's not like you're going to see, like, you know, white Americans becoming lederhosen wearing Germans <laughs> right. and, and uh, you know, round heads and all kinds of crazy, right. you know. But, um, no, they're going to start worrying about the themselves top. and their own. Right. Right. And, I mean, if you want to talk about the United States possibly balkanizing i can definitely see that in the next 20 years um and what you'll see in the u.s is instead of um like the chaos that happened at the end of the roman republic Mm -hmm. um what you would see in the u.s is like several roman republics you will find that the u.s would possibly split into several autonomous regions and each one of them will be headed by a kaiser I say Kaiser because I took Latin, but <laughs> saying Caesar might reach a greater audience. Right. <laughs> but democracy, as it stands right now, will relinquish itself in the West. And I'm not saying that with hope or with despair. I'm saying it simply will happen. It, it, right now, as it stands... The West has no great causes. This is Yukio Mishima. In a democracy, or in a political democracy, right, there are no great causes. Without these great causes, what's the point of continuing on in such a meaningless uh, existence? I'm going to take that further and go, why continue perpetuating democracy if it's meaningless? We're not getting anywhere. Fundamentally meaningless. Right, because we're sitting here every four years reversing what the other one did. Now, my Republican friends will probably bitch at me for saying this, but um, Republicans aren't doing anything. So really, it's just the left pushing everything. Mm -hmm. And I call them the left because it is a weird conglomerate. It is a nebulous mass. They have no real platform. It's a blue wave of sorts. Right. It really is the (laughs) deep blue. Yeah. (laughs) Because, like, they're anti a lot of things. I mean, the Republicans now are becoming more anti, but the... Democrats are like really anti if you think well, about it. <laughs> if you think if you think about if Democrats. we're going to talk left and right in the US, Democrat, Republican, whatever you want to call them. I think part of the problem is that you actually just touched on it. The Republicans are reactionary. They are anti something. Mm-hmm. So their position is not we should do you know, right. x y or right. z. It is all I am going to react to someone else trying to push on me X, Y, or Z. So how are you going to motivate a base to do something or to present a solution to a problem if your entire 
modus operandi is to just react to what the other right. side is doing. Yeah, and I, I wrote that down. That was actually the first note that I took for this um, was anti this, anti that. <laughs> that isn't a political platform. Your talking points have to be for something. Right. Right, and so you're not going to mobilize the masses. And I think that's what Republicans in the U.S. are lacking right now is that they can't get a grassroots movement going on. They're just anti-something, which is really sad because the Republicans traditionally, well, not traditionally even, I think it was the Trump publicans. The Trump publicans, yeah. They essentially are reactionary. But I think they didn't put into words what they were standing for. Mm -hmm. I think it was just like, well, if you're American, why wouldn't you vote for Trump? Like, mm -hmm. I don't understand. Like, he's pro-military, pro, military, pro mm -hmm. you know, this. But he wasn't saying he's pro anything. He was saying that he's anti-big government or anti-corruption, mm -hmm. drain the swamp, things right. like that. But um, I wrote further on to say that since I just said democracy will will fail or will go away, right? Democracy is a failing idea because it requires so many bulwarks in order to hold itself up. For example, you need free speech or at least unrestricted flow of information, right? We, we are losing that hysterically across the board because people don't want to hear the opposite slant of things. Right. And I'm not saying that once we crush the government or the elites that we'll have our eyes open. No, no. Far from that. <laughs> right. Um, number two, you need equality and equity across the board in perpetuity as just a general presupposition to exist in a democracy. Right. Because, you know, oh, the founding fathers, they only wanted certain people to vote. Right. Well, that's by the wayside. That's gone. Basically, the Constitution is crumpled up, thrown out the window, forget about it. Yes. Right. Because, it's not a living document. Because it's everyone dead. wants democracy so bad that we are willing to throw everything away for it, right? And so you need to have this equality mm -hmm. and equity as a presupposition. Like, that mm -hmm. has to be, if you don't believe in that, then you're literally Putin. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then the number three was the final one, but it really should have been the first pillar of democracy, if you will. You have to have trust in your neighbor to vote in your best interests every single time. Like, that's that, that doesn't happen. It doesn't. I don't think about, well, I, I don't vote, um, but I did at one point, and I didn't think about my neighbor when I was voting. And I seldomly believe that other people think um, of their neighbors when they vote. And I find it funny, too, that uh, people on the left will vote for anyone except their neighbor. <laughs> they, <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll, more, they'll sooner vote for someone who lives 2,000 miles away that is ostensibly similar to them than they will vote for someone who lives you know, 20 right feet next away. Door. Right. And so uh, that third one, that third point, the trust in your neighbor, that brought me back to how civilization is kind of built that it's it's predicated more so on um trust that fundamental trust that yes i won't kill you if you won't kill me i will work as hard as you will you know and i will also help maintain things right i'm not i haven't um i haven't dived too deeply into that um to talk about that anymore but i'll go backwards in saying building a civilization entirely predicated in those three pillars about um holding democracy up um building a civilization off of those things is foolish and is proven to work least of all in providing stability and wealth mm -hmm. democracy does not provide stability and wealth ongoing it will not it's kind it of a it's a boom bust cycle to, to touch on to touch on what you said i would go so far as to say that democracy destroys itself and it catalyzes what you could call strongmanism okay. because when you have when you have a nebulous group of people that have 
interactive and conflicting and all sorts of differentiation between their opinions, their thoughts, feelings, and motivations and goals, when you have such a malleous form, it doesn't know which direction to go. And on the same thing that we've already touched on and that we've mentioned before, it pulls itself in every which direction and eventually it will pull itself apart. But what what comes from that? What is the natural result of so many different people pulling at the same bed sheet? It's going to rip. And when it rips, whoever gets the largest piece dominates from there on. Yeah, you develop this strongmanism and we've seen it in you know, Weimar Germany. We've seen it in the United States even. After the Revolutionary War, George Washington was a household name. Everyone knew him. Everyone knew him. Everyone wanted him to be president, and he could have been president, king for life. He chose not to, which was a very admirable thing. And it's that sort of self-sacrifice that we don't find in today's environment. But continuing on that same pipeline, the fact that there was still internal strife between the different states and trying to ratify the Constitution or the Articles of Confederation, weak government, all of these different interests. Oh, well, Virginia's interests don't lie with the interests of Delaware. Georgia's interests don't lie with the interests of New Hampshire. All of these different directions and push-pull resulted in people calling for a more authoritarian government, and that's how we got the Constitution. There were people in the early United States... Well, they weren't quite united yet. But there were people in the early United States that thought that the Constitution was too radical. It was too authoritarian. It gave the federal government too much power. Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, they were all very staunch proponents of the federal government should have the power to you know, squash the state, if need be, to serve the greater interests. Whereas they're on the other side. Those were the Federalists, and on the other side you have the Jeffersonian you know, Democratic Republicans interesting that they have both parties in the name uh, but they had a more uh, hands-off laissez-faire approach they wanted for the government to be less involved but then again you get this two-party system it's this way or this way and it doesn't change but even in that even in all of that all of that strife there were still people calling for Washington to be the strong man and by his example of not becoming the strong man, then we got this tradition of, well, let's not give way to strong men. But even still, it happens. It happens over and over and over again. There's a, a really good example of this, actually. Huey Long. Are you familiar with Oh, Louisiana? Huey? Yes. yes. Huey Long, perfect example. There, I mean, Southern, white, and black people absolutely loved Huey Long because he had a very populist base. He had a very populist message of, I don't care who you are, I'm going to help you out. He was a little bit heavy-handed. He was pretty authoritarian. Some people have an opinion on that. And ultimately, he died because of it. But the point that I'm trying to get at is that when you have too much internal division, too much strife, the only way to come out of that once you find yourself in it is for a strong man to lift you out. Once... Once democracy starts to sour, once the process starts to sour, once people start to get tired of each other, hearing, bickering, listening to each other fight, that's when the strong man emerges. And we're getting to a point where it's going to happen, just like you said. It's going to happen. Whether you think it's right or wrong, it will happen. Are you going to be on the right side of it? That's, that's a separate question. I could only think of a centrifuge. Centrifugal force. Centripetal force. Yes, centripetal. Yeah, they will pull each other apart. Yes, and they will become more radical from each other as they pull. Mm -hmm. And part of that, part of that is just because of the culture that we've allowed to grow. I mean, if you look in the 50s and 60s, in the 70s is, is when it started to change. There was legislation that kind of led to this. Um, news coverage. Like we were talking about earlier, the mainstream media outlets, they present a narrative to you that is designed specifically to catalyze a 
reaction from you. And from that reaction, they can extract your viewership, your, your time, your attention, your money. That's how they make their money. That's their goal. Mm-hmm. Now, their goals can serve other people. Obviously, they have shareholders, and there are people that you know want them to go in a certain direction. Right, they'll rake in money and then right. give it to a... Essentially, yes. You know, politician. Yeah. So the direction or the narrative that the, the mainstream media will feed you is to serve a purpose of extracting value from you. It isn't to inform you. Whereas in the 50s and 60s, there was a, a deliberate culture of being unbiased. But we have allowed ourselves to become more biased, and through that, we can't escape that. There is no easy way to remove and scrape off the bias that we've baked into our culture now. Well, and I think because of the disgusting amount of money that's involved, that money power that you were talking about, because you sit here and you think, like, why are people involved in politics? Like, a lot of people shouldn't even have the right to vote. You know, like, <laughs> yes. you, you look at it and you're like, this crack whore has the same <laughs> voting capabilities right. as, like, you know, a very upstanding person with, you know, a family and they pay taxes and, right. you know, all this stuff, right? Why are people that have no business being in politics suddenly getting involved? I mean, in the last few elections, we've seen... Like an obscene amount of people are voting. Like it's it's the, the most amount of voters ever. Yeah, I mean, granted, granted, we have voters. there there are like a lot of ideas about that, but I can only think it's because the outreach of these um, news systems and whatnot. I can only think it's because that outreach demands their participation. Right, the system of governance. As it stands right now, this money power demands the participation of almost every single man, woman, and child. And they're glad when the opposition won't go out and vote. Mm-hmm. And so if you're sitting here going, well, I really don't like how Democrats are running the country, but I don't want to vote because, well, then you're giving the Democrats the power. Right. But I don't vote because I don't believe that I really do have any say <laughs> in it because they'll just find ballots. But I don't, uh, honestly, I don't care either way. I'm starting to see a little bit beyond the the scam that is the um, election cycle. Um, I'm not saying that to try to hold my chin up and think of myself as a great intellectual. It's just, I, honestly, I don't even know what to believe <laughs> anymore. When they like it that way. It's but purposeful. 99% of people on the planet should not have government doings and and whatnot in their head 24 7. right like I, people should not be going to collect garbage and talking to their coworker about oh who did you vote for not to say that people that collect garbage their opinion doesn't matter because a lot of intellectual people are in a lot of mm-hmm. rather um they're in jobs that are looked down upon if mm-hmm. you will but garbage garbage men around here get paid pretty well. <laughs> but <laughs> yes. um, it, but what I'm trying to say is that ruling should not be on people's minds twenty four seven. Right. We have so many other things to do in our daily life that we should be able to trust X Y and Z to govern stably. But because we don't have a stable system, because we're starting to turn into a real democracy. Mm-hmm. We're all worried 24 right. 7 about the most minute of things because realistically, Fox is painting it one way mm. and CNN is painting it another. Really, everyone would just normally be in agreement on how it should be handled, mm. but because there's a slant on it or because a sp- specific name is mentioned, mm. a lot of people get up in flames about it. And, I mean, that's the election cycle, uh, this last previous, this last previous, this previous one, um, the midterm, everyone was worried about abortion, but it had already been, you know, I don't know where I want to go with that, but it was, 
I think I see where you're going. The abortion issue was already individual states had already passed laws based on what the majority of the people in that state thought right, should right. happen. And if you found yourself on the minority side of what you felt should happen in your state, then you were quite worried about what might happen. And so right. you were involved in the electoral process. I'm going to vote for this person because I feel because I agree with them on their stance on you know this issue here. Right. And I've recently found that I sit here and I go, well, I don't really believe in democracy. Like, I, I, don't, I don't trust it. It's just run, ran by... Here, I'm just going to read this. I hate democracy as I do the plague. That is a direct quote from Aaron Stumer, <laughs> right? But I go on further to say that it's formless masses, opinionated solely by Hollywood and buzz phrases. All led to demise by a polished public figure with polished rhetoric um, and, oh yeah, all right, it's a polished public figure with polished rhetoric, right? He's only choosing to say what people right. are willing to vote for, right? So perception now trumps intellect. I'm going to say that again. Perception trumps intellect. The way people are seeing things trumps the way that they could think about right. things. So it's, as I said, an emotional response rather than a rational res response, right? Well, I have a... Um, and anyone who continue, sees beyond it continue. really is a conspiracy theorist. That's Everyone is getting called a conspiracy theorist. If you see beyond the polished rhetoric mm. of the person that you don't know why you're watching this person, you don't know why this person is talking about this, why it's important. It right. wasn't important 10 seconds ago, but then all of a sudden it's important to you and you're an expert. Say you look beyond it a little bit, you're a conspiracy theorist immediately. Right. Because you are not following whatever narrative that they are pushing out that's going to get them votes. Right. And so they ostracize you in, in that fashion. Right. And... Yeah, okay, so going back, I was saying that I don't believe in democracy, and so I've noticed that if I really don't care, if I don't believe that the opinions of other people really matters or even is worth a, worth a damn, why am I posting comments on things? Why am I right. commenting on a YouTube channel and I want to, you know... What 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 surface what purpose does that serve? Right. Well, I have a. This is something that I wrote. This was this was three years ago. Now this this is tangentially related, which is why I'm saying it. And this is more of a this is more of a spiritual issue, but it has to do with the political aspect of what we're talking about. Is it not a common maxim that one should never build his house on sand? that he must build his house on a solid rock. Why, then, should society be built and influenced by the malformed individual attitudes and temporal desires of those who are apathetic and complacent, which shift and move just as shapelessly as sand? Should not such a society be built on a rock, a firm idea, or a firm system? So, what I'm getting at is, why... <laughs> why do we govern ourselves, or why do we are, allow ourselves to be governed by people who don't know what they're talking about. Just to put it simple. Most people have no real, complete opinion that is valid on what goes on in terms of where the country should go, what we should do, how something should be done. Now that isn't to say that your opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion does matter. You know, my, my opinion on what should happen in the country is valid. But that does not mean that my vote is absolute objective truth in terms of what is correct and what shouldn't be. There should be a firm system that everything refers to that takes into consideration our individual temporal desires, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and then filters through those a productive direction. So what that would look like is not democratic. Now that isn't to say that 
what's ideal is a totalitarian, authoritarian, cold, brooding system. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that, like you said earlier, why should a why should a crack whore have just as much say in how a country is run than a person who has a stake, a long-term stake, that being children, taxpayer? Why does their vote matter just as much as someone else's? Right, and it it's really, truly, I believe that it is from the false idea of equality and perpetuity. Yes. That's when we start talking about a meritocracy or we start talking about an aristocracy where your investment, a.k.a. your wealth, right, <laughs> determines whether you have a say or not. And those are... Generally, you would want to go along the lines of a meritocracy um, if you really believe that there are good men amongst common people, which mm. I definitely believe. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to read something from my Revolt of the Masses notes. Um, even among what most consider the masses, right? So people might think of the masses as the working class. Um, Igaset reminds us in, um, I, I don't think it was Revolt of the Masses, but um, in another book, he reminds us that the masses, you might be a multi-billion, you know, multi-billionaire, right? You can still be part of the masses. Mm -hmm. Taking it, you know, you're just a consumer, you're just kind of a, you know, lazy. Even though you're producing quite a bit and you're like making all this money, you might be part of the same mindset of the masses, which realistically this strive for money is a very mass man idea. Yes. Right. Very much so. And so even among what most would consider the working or the masses, aka the working class, there are still very noble and disciplined minds. The masses, the term masses does not necessarily imply any economic or hierarchical classes defined by the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, but of the minds of men. The masses implies what the masses really means is the mindset of men. It is not necessarily evil that we now have the ability to enjoy things in greater quantities. It's just an observation, right? Um, it's an observation, really, that the noble, the nobleman, the noble class, has been displaced. It simply means that the masses that didn't exist before the industrial world, for better or for worse, have now injected themselves into affairs such as politics that were previously not their domain. Such, a, such an institute is dubbed hyper-democracy. Because you can have a democracy with, as we were just talking about, a meritocracy, mm -hmm. or with an aristocracy, which generally the founding fathers, they wanted their democratic systems within this republic they wanted it to be, to be conducted by a series of qualifiers. Right. Right. And I believe it was white, 17, male, land owning. Yes. Right. Protestant. And Protestant. Yes. <laughs> I don't think they really barred Catholics. That was, from they didn't bar Catholics, but they certainly frowned upon them. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly made only one state Catholic. Okay. <laughs> well, no, Maryland and Pennsylvania were both Catholic. Yeah. Because Charles the Third. No. What was Charles II's heir? It was Charles the Third. Yeah, yeah. After he got queen, I believe. after he got decapped and then somebody <laughs> decapped as, as yeah, somebody else maybe reigned. Well, I, obviously it was Lord Protector Cromwell. It was um, James the first and sixth or something crazy like that. Yeah, because he was the first of England, but the sixth of Scotland, yes. or yeah. vice versa. The it was the first, first of, of Scotland, and sixth of Scotland. Okay, very well. Um, Something crazy. Like yeah, that. be that as it may, the the actual heir, uh, the the very next king right. of England, he um, he gave Pennsylvania to because he converted to Catholicism in like sixteen eighty five when he was dying. Right. But anyhow, anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, these hyper qualify or these these qualifiers relegated this idea of voting and democracy to like a very small group of people, which okay that makes sense because they're accountable for mm -hmm. um, 
you know, owning land, that's a huge stake in the late 17, early 1800s, you know, right. because literally agriculture, <laughs> like that's the right. only, this is at the time of the very beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. Right. So, like, land is literally the only real measure of wealth that somebody has. And so, in the state of the United States, right, in the government itself, mm. right, what constituted the state's power was the relinquishing of that power of people that own the country, right, meaning the land, right? And so I think right now I will define the three terms, um, state, nation, and country. A lot of people have convoluted these terms right. in, in a way. Used them interchangeably. Right. A state specifically means the government, the system of government. Yes. The nation means the people. It's typically a nation are a, a group is a group of people that share a common heritage. And we can go so far as to say it's genetic and right. cultural, right? That's why we have things called the Iroquois nation, yeah. Iroquois nation. Yeah. Um, it refers to a specific people, right? Right. Um, addresses to uh, the German nation by Fichte is talking about German mm -hmm. people, right? And then you have country, which I I think I may have defined it in a more special way, but it's just the land, literally the land. Mm -hmm. That's I think in regular English we say we're going out to the country, or they live out in the country, right. meaning on the land. Right. Um, I think that's a general thing that we speak of. I just wanted to get those out of the way so that when we continue talking about them, um, or at least when I say them, people will know what I mean. Right. And you'll want to write those down because we will continue to use those terms as we define them. Right. Very good. Um, but right, once we have gotten rid of these um, qualifiers for democracy, if you will, you get this hyper-democracy. And at some point, they will, or may have already in our time, hand their powers to specialized individuals again. We were talking about this, right? There's a strong man. He shows up. People are going to, now that we have this hyper-democracy that everyone mm -hmm. has vote, everyone has power, they will relinquish their power. If they haven't already, I'm talking in real time now, if right. they haven't already done so, they will, and they're going to give it to a specialized individual right. who specializes in oration right this is where we get the term dictator it's because the way that they have spoken has mobilized the masses and since world war one if you want to talk about total mobilization of a population like look no further than 1914 right because that's when it all started that's your techno democracy like all of these systems every come into play echelon of society was mobilized for the purpose right of war. yeah and at the end of the great war you saw the end of the old order of things, mm -hmm. like the church, the monarchs, everything toppled after that. And what what remained in its place, in terms of government, you have democracy. In terms of just everyday power and, and things like that, it, it's the money and it's the machines. And like we were talking about last week, and I, I kind of more so formulated the idea is that well, as the machines have become more developed, as work has become more um, mechanical, we have become specialized in certain areas, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking purely in terms of, let's say, the assembly line. Instead we of talked you, about this last week. Right. So instead of you being able to make an entire car by yourself, mm -hmm. you now only know how to put one bolt and one screw in. <laughs> and that specialization, um, in particular, has relinquished your power. And so you now work in areas where the machine itself cannot do it. Right. Right. And so that relegates you to very specific tasks. So it's limiting your freedom mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Right. Um, you kind of now have to work around technology rather than technology working around you. But we can see that um, not necessarily makes sense all the time because, like, your phone helps you work around a lot of things. Oh, right? absolutely. 
but it's also in in the sense that like if you're a factory worker now you're working around the machines and things like that because you have to do what the machine can't do mm -hmm. whereas some machines are doing what you cannot right well i mean but, if you say you work an office job a lot of what you might do will be clerical work that machines or computers or outsource or outsource work can't do yes it's data yes. data control yes and so that's definitely that's definitely a direction that that we've come mm -hmm. in so far is that does affect our food actually. right and so i i think that mentality may have affected us in a way that we didn't really know is that oh leave it to the specialists because they know exactly what they're doing because i am not aware of systems outside of what i normally do and i think that's why we've kind of circumvented our own intelligence in a way because we are now giving our political um intervention a way to as i said a specialized individualism and i mean spengler called these you know caesars this is you know caesarism right where we give our political power we hand that over right we we've done so much to bring these men up and now they have power because they have they control the social power that mm -hmm. ortega y gasset mentions right jose ortega y gasset um that he mentions we've given them social power now they can influence all these different areas of our life because we're as ken ham says we're putting on our glasses Right. And we're only looking through the lens as they prescribe to us. Right. right. I, I kind of view politicians as an optometrist. They give us the lenses with which to see everything else. Right. Yes. They tell that the cameramen where to point. You don't know who the cameraman is. You don't know why you're being made to see this. Right. And you don't know for what cause. And the frame is always controlled. Right. Of course. And so voting at the ballot was democracy. Living political ideas and expressing them as a pressure on others is hyper-democracy. I'm going to yes. read that again, that, that second <laughs> part. Living political ideas, ideals, and expressing them as a pressure on others is hyper-democracy, which will never undo itself in time. Time will not do away with this, well, with the wokeism. Right. Mm -hmm. We can specifically talk about the left. Right. They're pushing a lot of new ideals mm -hmm. and a lot of different things on people. And that's just not going to go away by sitting here and waiting on it. Like it's to the detriment of all people right. that one ideologue is pushed upon everyone else. And if you question it because of the amount of social power that this thing has, because right. these people are looking at it only through one lens, they cannot and will not perceive it through someone else's shoes, that they they will, that's the destruction of democracy. Right. Because you go into hyper-democracy, which makes everyone this grand and nebulous wave. Well, a, and that wave will come crashing down and flood everything. Yes. A good way of, a good way of thinking about it, actually, is uh, like an abusive relationship. Say your partner does something that you don't like, they're crossing a boundary of yours, and instead of you setting an expectation to not continue doing that, you allow it to happen. You think, oh, you know, they did this thing. I should, I don't like that. I should probably tell them that I don't like that. But, you know, it's just one time. I'll let it go. And then it happens again. And if you, again, don't obstruct it, you have set an expectation that that is okay. And so what we're seeing is with specifically the Republican Party, if I'm, we're backtracking a little bit, but specifically with, I'll say, the right wing in the U.S., we are setting an expectation that whatever gets handed down from whatever powers that be, be them left or right or what have you, what we're seeing is that the right wing are just allowing this change to happen. They're not doing anything about it, whereas on the other side of the spectrum, they are deliberately, like you said, forcing their expression upon other people and that immediately continues and it it's exponential right it so doesn't the, stop the left right now is hyper democratic the, the left right now is hyper democratic while the right is possibly just regularly democratic Th to me the right is very cowardly 
because they're worried about the opinions of the left. And so mm-hmm. they'll tiptoe around and they will start using the terminology used by the mm-hmm. left and things like that. Because, because they don't, it. yeah, they don't want doxxed and they don't want, you know, and they're like, well, maybe we should do this. They're trying to say things in such a, I don't even, I want, I want to say the right word. Um, it's passive aggressive. Yes. In a way. There, well, maybe we we shouldn't be worried about, you know, like, transgenderism when we have, other, you know, like, they're like, well, maybe we shouldn't. Don't you think, like, if you start any sentence with that, you have no spine and no backbone. Yes. Because if you are really a political orator and you believe that you are on the right side, you will speak with authority on these things. Because... You really do have to give people a lens to look through something because mm-hmm. they won't understand your perspective because language they may not come language, from the same place that you do. Right, language is somewhat democratized in a way. Like it's one of those things that just changes between regions or just between individuals. Right. Like so in in order to think you have to speak, but in order to speak you have to have thought. Right. And so there there are things that people will try not to say so that they don't disrupt their base or whatever. But um, Igasset, he says, this social power that these people have influences those that would read intellectual ideas to reject ideas that they are not in agreement with completely. So say you read something. If you don't agree with it 100%, reject it. Even if it was 99% on, on your side, mm-hmm. you reject it. They're now the enemy. That's what the left tends to do a lot. But don't get me wrong. It's absolutism. Right. The right also does it. If, if you agree with everything, well, no, not the case anymore because we've seen it recently because there are transgender Republicans. There are like generally, um, well, recently, usually the view is that minorities would never be a Republican. Right. Right. It's kind of like, you know, well, and they call them Uncle Tom's because right. a black person doesn't completely agree with the left. Right. They are now no longer right. black or they are no longer, you know, I mean, you don't the, vote the for me, you ain't said, black. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and so that happens with the masses and then with right. people that try to maintain a aristocracy, if you will, not so much. Right. And so the mass man cannot immerse himself to play with new ideas because of his social power or perhaps the social power over him influencing him, right? This is, we're talking sociological, uh, psychological, and just through general subversion. Like social, sociological and psychological subversion are doing that mm. to the masses, right. right? And so in order to not be like everybody, one runs the risk of elimination, Right. Yes. And so, like we just said, the Uncle Toms that right. are um, in the Republican Party, right. right, because they're not like everyone, they immediately get eliminated because of the vast nebulous wave that is hyper democracy. Right. And I'm, I'm trying to come up with another term because that's a term coined by um, Igasset was that that was hyper democracy. I like it needs to sound so much more dangerous. Because I don't think people realize that this idea of like the, the mob rule, mm. if, if you are not in the mob, you will be ruled over. You will be stepped on. Right. And that everything that I've quoted from right now is just from chapter one. There are 15 <laughs> chapters in this. And I mean, we're, we're at an hour and 20 minutes on time, thereabouts. And like... I feel like I could go on forever and ever and ever. Um, It really is a good book. I recommend it to everyone. I really think that everyone should read this book. You can find it on Amazon, and I highly recommend the three other books by Igasset. Um, Well, and just just to give context as to where this Jose Ortega Igasset came from, or the world that he was in, he was in the, you know, early 20th century in pre-Francoist Spain. Right. Very interesting that the same situation that led to a strongman type government spawned this author and right. his ideas. Yeah, they came from a republic that diverged itself between right-wing authoritarians and left-wing ultra-authoritarians mm-hmm. vying, vying for the same amount of power but through different means. Right. 
And for different reasons as well. They both absolutely wanted absolute power. And so they were going to do it through different means. And through f via the right wing, it was just... It was pure strongmanism, right? They had a few men that they really wanted to... Um, you can go ahead and put that over. <laughs> he spent the last 10 seconds trying to blow out this candle. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> it's weird. A 1776 will never die. Yeah. So strongmanism, right? They literally just chose their own dictators and generals and things like that. And then on the left, they were choosing the masses. But the masses were going to relinquish their power to you know, whatever political party was ruling at the time anyway. Right. And I think, I think people tend to underestimate that what is different about our society is that we have so much of an ability to speak, but the, the ability to speak does not make you intelligent. Ah, there's the Star Wars quote. There's the Star Wars quote of the day. But just because, just because you can have an opinion and you can say your opinion and your opinion can be valid in, in one way or another does not mean that it is something that can be applied on a broad spectrum that will affect other people because ultimately, just like I was talking about, we're all you know, pieces of sand and sand moves and sand, you can't build anything solid on sand. Well, I think it's quite funny that, I mean, we may even include ourselves in this, just because you have an idea does not mean it's legitimate. And I, I feel that that, is necessary to to say because I think we really do since the Enlightenment have this burning idea in our heads that equality in perpetuity exists and it doesn't no one is equal to themselves on any given day I mean for instance you know I was a bad person yesterday I'm a better person today or I'm a worse person today I'm not equal to the person I was yesterday. We're constantly evolving and our situations change. And one of um, Igasset's main ideas is yo soy yo y mi circunstancia, right? I am me and my circumstances. Yeah. That doesn't just mean you and the decisions you've made, but the country you were born in, the mm -hmm. household you were born in, everything. No one is born in a vacuum. Right, exactly. That's a beautiful way of putting it is that everything that has ever happened has not necessarily climaxed to this moment, but has led to you. Like, right. those are your causes, and you are the right. um, effect, it's in a, a sense. It's a perpetual state of exposition, not climax. Right, and so you do have somewhat... Now, I don't want to get into the causality and predestination and things like that. <laughs> but That's a whole different topic. Yeah, there, there is a... There's a min minutia of things that you can direct in your life, mm -hmm. right? But the decisions that you make and the choices that you have to make mm -hmm. are literally based on everything else happening. Right. So is it an illusion of choice that you have? Right. That's, well, then, that's a whole other question. How free are we really? Yeah, how free <laughs> are we really? And uh, no, but I don't even remember where I was going now. I said you are you and your circumstances, and anyways, so we go back to, let's go back to the beginning, right? We're talking about democracy as it stands in our current world. I believe firmly that it is this strange enlightenment idea of equality at all times, meaning that you are no different from yourself yesterday or anyone else mm. and that your ideas will therefore have validity at all times mm. and i think that's a very dangerous thing to think because some people have really good ideas and some people have very very bad ideas <laughs> and th this is when you get these random people that will stand up and they go, well, that's not real communism. That's not real capitalism. That's not real democracy. And it's like, oh, so you are the moral avatar of, you right. know, and I think it was Jordan Peterson that said, you're going to bring in this utopia. Like, you're the only person that could ever do it. Like, right. you know, all these guys were wrong. Think different, bucko. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's what he said. Or... Something sunshine. I think yeah. he called somebody sunshine after. Yeah. And people laughed and he was like, no, it's not funny. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and it's like, well, Kermit is funny. <laughs> but 
unfortunately, uh, yeah, he's fallen from grace in my eyes recently. But that's besides the point. In a de democratic system, he's allowed to have his own ideas. <laughs> but they won't last for long. <laughs> um, but enough about Igasset. We're talking about democracy and how it looks now and how we think it will end up. So for the last half hour or so, um, we can talk about that. Or um, I can go on a Spengler rant. <laughs> <laughs> we should find an equal mix of the two. Right? Yeah. Okay, so let, let me go through these books, right? I have Decline of the West by Oswald Spengler. Very well-known author talking right. about... Chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you've probably heard of Spengler in some capacity. And if you Rant. haven't, go Google him. <laughs> Google him and read the damn book yeah. and take damn notes, because they're good. <laughs> um, in The Decline of the West, you get this general sense of... He is saying that history is cyclical in the fact that there are lifespans of civilizations. Every civilization goes through this lifespan, and it's almost exactly the same cycle every time. Um, what he feared was that when democracy ends, that it'll be the rise of Caesarism, where these strong men come about. Kali Yuga. Yeah, Kali Yuga, exactly. <laughs> but it's like, after the... After the... Oh, it starts with a C... No, it starts with a D after the deluge. <laughs> yes. Um, that Caesarism will happen, that these warlords would rise up or that these strong men will rise up and mm -hmm. um, basically just continue destroying what's left of what was once great. In, in this room right now, there are paintings up on the wall by Thomas Cole called The Course of Empire. I'm not telling you if you look at these paintings that you will have read Decline of the West, but this is the Im <clears throat> this is the image that you would get if you are to read Decline of the West. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I encourage people, if they are to read it and look at those paintings, I want them to see which part they think we're in right now. For me, it's very obvious. <laughs> What helps, what helps right now is the fact that you have these paintings. Yeah. Or prints of these paintings. Yeah. They're very beautiful paintings. They're very nice to look at. Yeah. I think to copy, to, to, to move from what you were saying and to transition to what just popped into my head. Society is cyclical. It is absolutely cyclical. It's this constant process of Building and destroying and building and destroying. Boom, bust. It's an economic term we can apply it to. There is this consistent process of as soon as a society is created, it reaches its peak, it falls. There's struggle, and from that, a new society takes form. It reaches its peak, its peak it falls. We're in this wave or peak you could say we're at the peak you could say we're approaching it you could say we're on the downslope from it but it's happening and so it's just a matter of like we said earlier are we prepared for it or are you prepared for it have you thought about what your role might be in it and i think maybe now it's important to introduce because basically we're talking about gloom and doom here right we're talking about this revolt of the masses they're rising up and it's usually, generally the case that the nobles, the very noble men that built civilization on particular ideas, they hand the crown down to the common folk who don't know necessarily how to rule, mm -hmm. but will do so in, in a way that is um, not conducive of perpetuating the ideal. Yes. Right? And so we have these other books, right? Um, Bread and Circuses is like, you know, moral collapse and societal decay. That'll be the end of the empire, right? 
Um, you have Society of the Spectacle, which is more so particularly talking about how technology is now influencing us to be desensitized to a lot of things and that we need... We need greater emotional stimuli, if you will, in yeah. order to move. I forget with whom I was having this conversation the other day. Wow, that's... Huh, I'm going to have to take more notes on that. Um, it was the idea that you need to have bombastic claims. and we're, Was that, that was, us? That was us. We was that literally that. last week? That was week? our last episode. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, we, that's what we're talking about in terms of technology. Technology has essentially deprived us of our external stimuli that would force us to be motivated in a different way than we're motivated now. We lack certain motivations because our lives are fundamentally easy. Contextually, at least. Oh, yes, yes. I did have this conversation with somebody else after the podcast. And I, I think I wrote down more notes, but... I am bereft of memory at the moment. <laughs> but Society of the Spectacle, nonetheless, um, by Guy DeVord, um, is more so talking about modernish society. Archaeofuturism by Guillaume Fay was probably one of the first more modern right wing books. I read that back when I was in high school. And I, I thought it to be very oxymoronic archaeo futurism right that is kind of an interesting uh, juxtaposition <laughs> right and honestly I, I i can see where you know what i'm not even going to get into that because it does take us off topic quite a bit but let's maybe get into where we talk directly to our listeners and we should probably talk to them a little bit more about strivalism because that's essentially discourses on strivalism. That's yes. our mission. And so I have always thought of the strivalist as <laughs> <laughs> I have always thought of the strivalist more as an anti-democratic kind of man. And if everyone else is a strivalist, they would realize that they should also be anti-democratic right i have i have some writing that would be relevant here okay so this is right underneath what i was talking about the the firm idea that we should build society upon instead of you know the temporal movements of sand yeah the four every four years <laughs> so now this this has to do with more of a i wouldn't call it an authoritarian state but it's fundamentally not a democratic one so a state cannot be seen or function as something so low cold and brooding insofar as its only abilities are to reprimand and enforce a police state no the state must provide provide a motivation for its people a directing guiding spiritual force not unlike the parents to a child should a parent not care for sculpt and mold and raise a morally upright responsible child which will carry their torch into the future this is not to say that a population should be seen as, per, as a perpetually infant body subservient to an omnipotent parent. Just as children age and grow wise as their parents, and parents age and become feeble, so too should government adapt with the changing times and remain capable and flexible for the future. Time is a transcendent constant, and so too should be the ideas of the state. Now the angle that I have with that is that with strivalism and the way that that's relevant, is that strivalism seeks to always be improving. It seeks to always have a motivation for improving. And so part of the problems with democracy are that it deprives you of motivation above you trying to get what you need from everyone else. Democracy fundamentally wants you, it pits you against everyone else. I'm going to do what I need to protect myself or to get resources for myself and my family and other people like me, we will form a group and then I will do what I need to do from there. Whereas with strivalism, if the individual, if each individual is strivalistic, we'll call it, 
I'm going to coin that term. If each individual is strivalistic in nature, you find your motivations within yourself. And if the individual next to you also has their motivations within their, themselves to improve, to always be improving, and to always be motivated, to always have the central tenets of strivalism in the top of their mind to survive, to reproduce, and to maintain in healthy, beneficial, productive ways. So the state should assist in not keeping people in line, but helping people stay motivated. Democracy is a system which does not motivate people above their base interests, like I was already saying. So how, how can you balance how can you balance the individual needs with the group needs? Democracy does not provide that balance. It fundamentally asks you to only think about yourself. And the benefits you could receive in voting a certain way or right. whatever. I mean, that that's the money power that democracy has devolved into. But we have already said that democracy can never work, never has. It's never produced stability in any shape or form. Right. And so there is something about a strivalist philosophically where there's this archetypal self-sacrifice that goes on and on in his own brain where he is constantly sacrificing present pleasure for future gain. And he may not even be the one to obtain that gain. It might be his children or his grandchildren or his grandchildren's grandchildren. Right. And so where does the state necessarily come into all of this? You could say, well, the state um, holds programs that provide uh, social pressure for um, strivalists to continue to do better but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, like, what is the best state of man? Like, where does it end? I mean, is it really the state's goal to provide men with the, the mission for, say, landing on the moon and things like that? I don't think it's their job. But I think it's a very powerful tool exactly. to use. And, you know, I'm thinking in a strivalist society, it's not with the elimination of other classes, which mm -hmm. we may or may not talk about. Um, but a strivalist exists in society with these other classes. And so Go ahead. I, I think it is very important that your leaders, in order to grow their population, leaders need to motivate mm -hmm. and facilitate strife and struggle and competition right. i think it is generally necessary and i i think we got on this um last episode when we talked about um the collective arms race that was the u.s right. and the soviet union that there was a common goal at the end and so is it the government's idea or goal really is it ideal for the government to pit strivalists up against one another or how, how do you get an internal comp competition to motivate men to do right. this and i think this is where strivalism is not necessarily a political doctrine it's more so philosophical and for it to spill over into the political i think requires um a lot more in-depth um writing Yes. But I will say, right off the get-go, <laughs> that the strivalist is not democratic because the strivalist deeply, profoundly, and fundamentally believes in a hierarchical structure. He's very naturalistic in that sense, that he devotes himself to more nature and... I'm not going to say less technology. I don't believe in intellectual cavemen. I don't believe that's the <laughs> ideal. It's not. 
it, but it is the limiting of technology because I have found since last week at least that there is no balance between technological perfection and human mm. perfection. There can only be one. And as of right now, I am under the belief that technological perfection is what is currently taking shape. And I, I, I say that in both a philosophical and physical sense. Humans are getting fatter, dumber, lazier, and we are passing off our powers, our human powers, we're passing those off to machines, right? We don't necessarily want to lift things. So in a factory, we have machines lifting things. Mm -hmm. We don't want to think, we don't want to exert our own mind onto something else. We're not creative, right? We would rather have our mind be exerted upon by something else, right? And I, I say something because I really don't believe that, well, maybe I do. But I'm going to finish my statement. I don't believe that men are always behind the illusion of choice that we have. Because the AI that we are programming now, yes, we are programming them. So there are men right. kind of behind this, right? <laughs> That's where I, I may have caught myself. But I think that AI is getting smart enough where it is providing men with choices where a lot of people aren't seeing it. They, they think it's free will, A, B, C, or D. They don't really think, you know, oh, I only have four choices. They think, right. oh, I have four choices. Look at yeah. that. Well, and it goes back to, it goes back to how strivalism is, it's not individualistic so much that you make your own choices, but it's not, I don't want to say socialistic, but it's not so socialistic that you are totally constrained by the other people around you. It's, oh, it's totally it's anti-socialistic. I have a, I have some parts of my notes here. Strivalism is not exclusively individualistic, is not an exclusively individualistic or socialistic paradigm. It guides the actions and interactions of all who acclimate themselves to such a paradigm. Mm -hmm. Many systems seek to govern and regulate, whereas strivalism is a system of self-governance and self-regulation. It therefore brings the individual the energy necessary to bring about his true potential, while it motivates the social environment to keep him accountable. Right. So, human beings require social norms and rules. You know, they're not absolute. These shift over time, but there are, however, constants that do not change. Those are ingrained in our biology. Strivalism seeks to maximize the social life of the individual by guiding the social framework he finds himself in. Art, music, exploration, adventure, media, and the culture which molds him and which he molds back must be a growing experience, not a stagnant, decadent one. And so, backtracking a little bit even, you know, what is this paradigm that I'm talking about? It's a human paradigm. It's to pass on our genes and those genes to exist in a continually fulfilling, pure world. That's the human strivalism paradigm or strivalistic paradigm. So there can't be any straying from that. It has to be applied in every area of existence if that's the paradigm that you will subscribe to. So this is an exclusively pro-human system. Meaning, purpose, and human fulfillment are all, I use air quotes, excited by this paradigm. It, it must not seek to make life easy nor hard, but to let the human spirit flourish and grow through the struggle to improve, through calm daily peace or exigent adversity. Humanity cannot improve when life is easy, and quali quality of life is paramount to a successful life. So the necessity to strive, therefore, the balance between the two, is the ultimate human paradigm. There has to be a delicate, perpetual balance between struggle and calm. It's like yin and yang. You know, mountains are nothing but molehills without the valleys to grant them their height. So, too, humanity must have fulfilling goals, struggles, and a uniting paradigm around which it can continually grow. It is a fundamentally forward-thinking paradigm, as it seeks to maximize future gains, not at the cost of the present, but at the realization of how the present can manifest the future. 
as a humanistic approach, strivalism understands human emotions, impulses, and base motivations as a paradigm. It seeks not to suppress or repress, but to channel and guide human energy into a direction that provides fulfillment, benefit, meaning, and purpose. The paradigm does not impose on the human spirit. It surfaces the best aspects of such a spirit, such that man elevates himself by manifesting his true inner greatness. Now, I'm vague when I talk about, you know, fulfillment, benefit, meaning, purpose, true inner greatness, because it needs to be a nebulous term. What might be true inner greatness for me will be different from your true inner greatness, but they should overlap. There can't be... My true inner greatness cannot be starkly different, totally opposed to yours. Correct. There has to be unity and some overlap in our greatness. But the thing, the thing about it is, is that if we had the same greatness, if we had the exact same greatness, then we would cease to be different. So it's not hive mindism. You can't, you can't have that. Communism does not work. Hive mind does not work. No matter how many people try to get you to think that everything is unanimous and everything should be in lockstep, it's impossible. We're different creatures. We're different organisms that, you know, we're not born in a vacuum. If we were born in a vacuum, then sure, we could have total conformity, total Long. uniformity. Right. But there has to be overlap. It's, so, it's that lack of overlap that causes problems. It causes friction, and it, it's the same reason why democracy doesn't work. Well, then would you argue in a way that there is almost a disposition at birth of what you may be relegated to do? So yes. um, That's where the hierarchy comes from. Okay. So, just like you were saying earlier, this... This issue of equality at all costs, I would take it even farther as to say that people think that it's equality of circumstance and equality of outcome, and that both of those are an achievable ideal, because that is quite literally impossible. Right. You and I were born under different circumstances, right. and we will certainly have different outcomes. You know, the difference in these outcomes, it might cause pain if one of us is has more success or more you know resources or whatever than the other but that's life that's the whole point right. evolution is a process that forces some to win and some to lose there can never be a total equality of circumstance and a to total equality of outcome but there can be a system or a paradigm that we all acclimate to that will allow us to, regardless of our circumstances, try to climb up as far as we can. Now, that doesn't mean that we can all reach the same height, that we can all reach the same rung on the ladder, but not climbing, you're already there. So, do we, in a... And let, let's put strivalism in a government, right... If we believe that a certain something is an ideal or, you know, is a goal for somebody to increase. Okay, let me let me back up. We talk about personal growth a lot for strivalism. Mm -hmm. And I, I firmly believe that. I think that is like a great thing to do. If yeah. everyone is personally striving for their own perfection, even though the strivalist knows that perfection is unattainable. Because once you become perfect, you're no longer human. I think the faults are what makes us human and the ability to not be perfect. We can be perfectly human, but that doesn't mean that we are perfect, right? Right. Um, let's not forget, one of the main things about strivalism is that biological imperative. Yes. All of his actions must go along that. And so it just so happens that we are a species albeit there are individuals within this species, but we are all part of a larger system. Mm -hmm. There really is no independent human, mm -hmm. right? There is no singular man living outside of his realm. Right. I think...
Well, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so when you go there, right, you're talking about survival of the species because the individual can't survive forever. Mm -hmm. And the way our species just so happens to do survival is through our genetic traits mm -hmm. and through our DNA. And we need to propagate our DNA and we need to reproduce. We need to adapt to new environments and we need to maintain our population. Well, if you can no longer maintain a proper balance between resources and population, this is where I think I would maybe argue that there is there is a fourth. And that would probably be expansion, which you called flourishing. Mm -hmm. But I, I said that that was part of adaptation and, you know, that, that's part of it. Right. Like your, your population will grow. It's just as it grows, you need to maintain a proper balance between right. population and resources. So if you need to grow your resources to maintain, you know, like to maintain, right. then you'll do that. If you need to lessen your population, you should. In the herd. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> I think nature has a way of doing that for us. Right. Um, ultimately, strivalists should constantly be seeking to push the boundaries of mankind. Metaphysically and physically. I do not think that life on Earth is destined to only be life on Earth. On Earth. What a great travesty it would be is if that somehow we are destroyed, more than likely probably by ourselves, or our inability to stop our destruction. Or the superbug. Right. If, what a travesty it would be that our light would be extinguished without anybody or anything else seeing it. Even if we survived on a golden record, as it were, and in millions of years from now, something else picks it up and it tells them, hey, we existed, we were here, we did this, we may live on in a less physical sense. I think that's more of the spiritual or metaphysical life of a strivalist, but I think the strivalist is con is greatly concerned with legacy, yes. not just his own personal legacy, but the legacy of others and the right. legacy of his species as a whole. And so, others aren't responsible for him. Right. He is responsible for everything. And if everyone views themselves in that way of a self responsibility to a greater cause. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a cause. It's not the state. It's not, you know, other people. It, and that's where I fear that people will look at it and be like, well, these guys are just socialists. And it's like, <laughs> no. This is metaphysical. It is not solely political. Right. And it, it is mostly metaphysical. But how do we get metaphysics? You know, like, well, it's one of our detriments of having evolved in this way right. is that we we have to... Metaphysics is an abstraction. We make perfect these notions of inner workings and outer workings mm -hmm. of things. And so this metaphysical adaptation that we have comes from our dipping into the rational mind, right? And so emotionally and rationally, we are trying to create strivalism and the rational, more rational part of it, I believe, is what's going to spill over into governing and things like that. And I, I just, I, I don't have a framework for how it would look. It's kind um, of a difficult really, thing to peg down. It doesn't matter if it's a king or a dictator or, I mean, regrettably, a democracy. Right now, people can become strivalists. There's no conversion, really. I mean, there's no ceremony. It's not religious. But to be a strivalist is simply philosophically someone who begins to sacrifice temporary pleasure for future gain. And that strife 
is what will make you grow into you know what is the what is the strivalist yeah, well, what is the end step of the what is the plant that comes from the root but you're never going to find out unless you plant the root the best strivalist is the one that survives exactly well it, it's something that that you and I have talked about before uh, we we have been developing a sort of parable to help understand or to help describe what it would look like in a more worldly way. So say two brothers were, this was the brother's parable. You smile knowing what I'm talking about. Say two brothers are, you know, on the side of a mountain. It is very sparsely, you know, populated. There is very little foliage to speak of. They come across a single plant that bears a single ripe fruit. They decide, well, we'll increase our chances if we take this fruit and split up. We each take half, and we can eat some and plant some. So one brother takes his, and he takes the seeds from it. He doesn't eat much, just enough to sustain himself, maybe even feel full. But he takes the seeds, and he plants a tree. That tree will then grow and bear new fruit. And, you know, his, because he was able to survive, you know, you can expand it and take it even further. Other people were able to, other people as a direct result of him were able to see the same fruiting plant and pick from it and sustain themselves. While the other brother, he was only focused on saving himself or saving his strength at that moment, whatever. He ate most of the fruit, misplaced the seeds, tried to plant them too late at the wrong time, didn't think about it, was worried. That guy dies. <laughs> <laughs> and so fundamentally, the strivalist is the first brother. The, the strivalist is the person who takes the time and the thought and the effort to plant the seed. And tend to the plant and let the plant grow and flourish. Now, whatever that might mean, it's supposed to be vague. It's supposed to be something that you can apply to multiple areas in your life. It's not, we're not talking about a specific plant. We're not talking about a specific thing that you could do. We're not talking about politics or finances. It's all of those things all wrapped into one. Right. Philosophically, it's something that should, that should provide a motivation for you to be the best version of yourself and the layer underneath that is that's what perpetuating your species is right it was taking the time and well a little bit of forethought but more time and effort taking care of something that will grow for future generations rather than being selfish and consuming all of the fruit and misplacing the seeds or even eating the seeds with the fruit at once because essentially these two brothers they had their own villages and they were looking for ways of survival they were looking for new lands you know where um, they could provide food for their people and the older brother that found the tree he decided that he was going to take the seeds back to his people and bring the food to them right in, in a way that maybe they were going to begin producing agriculture from these seeds right and so the other brother was selfish thinking oh there is food here mm -hmm. whoever can you know whoever makes it out here um will be able to eat well when he ate the the fruit and either ate the seed or misplaced them entirely um the the tree is is uh dead the tree dies immediately upon them grabbing the fruit and so the the younger brother um he he decided that he was going to eat it and not save any for anyone else or even himself in the future and he ends up starving and dying and his people mm -hmm. also starve and die because of his selfishness mm -hmm. and the older brother's people live because of his sacrifice of not eating the entire thing he was you know they're both famished they're right. climbing a mountain i'm sure they would be <laughs> 
And yeah, so his his sacrifice in that moment is what allowed people to survive. And so there there is a that archetypal idea of self-sacrifice and we can find that through many mythologies. But that Strivalism isn't supposed to build an entire worldview that answers every single question. It's supposed to be the fundamental worldview upon which a new civilization is completely built. And so for me, it's hard to see skyscrapers when I'm focusing on the groundwork. Right. And you are too. Right. We're both focusing on groundwork. And so our ideal government is limited to the options that we have right now or right. what we have seen it's not what we will have seen when because strivalism is a, a vacuum right because strivalism we're trying to build a vacuum essentially with mm -hmm. that i mean one of the things that i've always written about strivalism it's not trying to take the best of humanity and do something with it it's trying to take the best from humanity mm -hmm. because i believe humanity to be an enlightenment ideal that puts unequals, equals, and everybody into this lump of, well, we're all human. Mm -hmm. There are some people that are demigods and titans mm -hmm. among us, and we don't allow them to see their potential because of our myth of equality. And yes. strivalism seeks to exit out of that and build a new civilization because it's not a return to before kind of thing mm -hmm. it, because like you said we're not born in a vacuum well no system no ideas are really born in a vacuum and it's really hard to say that oh strivalism will be so different because <laughs> but it's trying something new and i would or argue, at least trying i would argue that part of the motivation for strivalism because obviously just like you said you know nothing exists in a vacuum nothing comes from a vacuum i guess we could put it simply nothing is born of a vacuum so strivalism is a result of what we see in the world that being the temporal dissatisfaction or dissatisfaction i'm trying to articulate what i'm what i'm thinking here there's no meaning in anything anymore. You know, you and I both feel that just existing in the world that we're in, there's very little meaning and fulfillment to be had because of the way that things work, because of the world that we find ourselves in, the culture that we find ourselves in, and the environment that we find ourselves in. And I think just going to separate myself from myself i think part of what has helped me develop my thoughts on strivalism is the fact that there is less fulfill fulfillment to be found in my life because of my circumstances and strivalism is a way to not bridge the gap but bridge to somewhere to somewhere right. in general, because that's the problem. There's nowhere to go. Right. Strivalism doesn't seek to like regress back to a past where we did have meaning because the system that's in place right now is bereft of it. I'm, you know, I, I believe in causality. I think the systems that existed before led to the existence of our equity, hyper democratic system now. Mm -hmm. So going back like we were saying with technology last week, is that going backwards will only lead to this again. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have made an egregiously wrong turn somewhere in history, and going back to that point and like turning away, doing a uh, going a different direction, is great. But we also need to like surpass this. And so the mm -hmm. point of strivalism is to we're pushing the boundaries out, but we're also pushing. Uh, like an arrow through the firmament, if you will. We are like getting out of the bubble, right? And so outside the bubble. We're trying to get out of that vacuum mm -hmm. is essentially what's going on. And so it has to be chaotic in a sense, but creating chaos doesn't necessarily cause freedom, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's what a lot of people are seeing because in so much resistance to order, people are creating chaos and naming it freedom. Mm -hmm. It's not... It's, it's 
there is no freedom. It's not freedom from consequence. It's freedom of consequence. You are right. free to incur whatever consequences you want on yourself. That's not freedom. Right. And there are, there's a difference between the ideas of an individual and an independent. Mm -hmm. An individual exists freely within the fence. Mm -hmm. An independent exists freely outside, outside the of the fence. Both are limited by the fence in a fashion, right? Mm -hmm. Because an independent, if he is truly independent, he will not go within the system, mm -hmm. right? He's limited by the fence. But the individual who is within the fence, he's an individual part of a system, mm -hmm. right? And so he has to interact with only the things within the fence. That's the limitations of mm -hmm. technology, society, whatever you want to call it. Um, but he, the individual is severely limited because he considers himself part of a system, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I'm an independent thinker. Like, no one is. Well, no one really is an independent thinker. They're more individual, individual thinkers. Thinker. Something that I just, that just popped into my head. On our last episode, we were talking about organic versus organized. Mm -hmm. Remember, we had talked about how organic everything exists in relation to something else. Whereas right. organized we've taken this very uh, technological approach where when we think of organize, we think of, well, separate, put into neat little boxes here and there. What strivalism is, to me at least, is an organic system wherein right. everyone exists in relation to each other, but you're still an individual. Right, and that's, that's why the main building blocks of the philosophy fall into... I don't want to call it pure biology, but it, it's biological narratives at the beginning because yeah. you talk about, okay, well, what is the purpose of a strivalist? And it's like, what is our meaning? What is the meaning and purpose to life? And it's like, well, I can't tell you so much about meaning, mm -hmm. but I can tell you about purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's about survival, mm -hmm. but it's more than survival. That's just the biological imperative. You now have different needs to be met with your instinct, emotion, and rationale because you can't just purely survive because we have emotion and rationale right. and like we need to feed into those things essentially because those also feed into the biological imperative a lot of people don't realize this but it's because we are actively disconnecting ourselves from nature that we're finding that we're not doing right the, we're not following the biological imperative and it's what's right. causing like a, the death of a species i would think about it as a uh... It's, it's not unlike the human body itself, actually. Right. There are different organs within our body. They all have specific functions, but they all work in relation to each other to form a whole. Right. And that whole is to survive and reproduce. To, as a species. As yeah. a species. Well, as an organism, as an mm -hmm. individual organism of human body, my liver is there for a specific function, mm -hmm. my body is not whole without my liver, and my liver is useless without my body. Correct. And so, fundamentally, the strivalist sees this reality, and he realizes that he has a place in history, in society, in his environment, to be connected with nature, and to use his abilities, his intellect, his emotion, and his rationale, to serve a higher purpose outside of himself, but also to serve himself, but more importantly, outside of himself, to propagate himself and everyone else and everything else that he is connected to. And we're connected to Earth, we're connected to the creatures around us, we're connected to each other. That's what strivalism sees. Right, and so I've talked about the masses in, in more of a negative way, because I, I did just say the strivalist wants to take the best from humanity right and so we just said wait it's all an interconnected system why are we talking about taking the strivalist away from the interconnected system that he's part of like other people you know people that might not be strivalists exist i have a personal opinion and i think this motivates me to write differently about strivalism sometimes is that the industrial revolution and in consequence, <laughs> now, the Industrial Revolution has led to a large increase in keeping people alive, and it suppresses the natural order of things, which yes. would be natural selection. Right. Right. I think 
nature and life have a way of culling the population and keeping the gene pool diverse yet strong. Um, and those systems are under attack by our medicine. And I think humans, it, it shows our great capacity for compassion mm -hmm. to keep everyone alive as long as possible. <clears throat> Abortion is now illegal. <laughs> like, um, I, well, I do find it strange, though, that we have this weird capacity for, well, we have to give all this money to the, these poor African children and these poor, because they're already born, but it's like we will be savage to those unborn hmm. in the name of saving humanity. But Penti Linkola has a metaphor that he used. Um, they he talked about a sinking ship and everyone gets into the life raft. The person that loves life will be cutting off the hands of people that aren't in the raft trying to get in and sink it because they're, they right. unknowingly are sinking it. Right. Right. And so all these people that want to give out medicine, right. Right. They're sinking the ship. And I'm not saying that everyone who isn't in my position is worthy of death. Um, I don't believe that at all. I just believe that our perpetuation of keeping everyone alive, no matter the disease, no matter the deficiency, right. we are risking our species survival for them. It's and a... it's, it's just our chemistry's fault that that right. thing happens. It's not that any one person is deciding this and they're killing one person and keeping others alive. I, I don't, I, I don't know of those things. So I won't say those things. And it's a difficult, it's a, it's an incredibly difficult question too, because you can get, you can very easily fall into eugenics. And we've seen how nasty that, that line of thinking can get social Darwinism as well. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to balance us observing social Darwinism and us allowing social Darwinism to happen with saving ourselves right. and wanting to live and the desire to live. I mean, you could argue that, you know, if, if strivalism is a fundamentally propagate yourself and your genes sort of idea, you know, what is to stop the deficient from you know continuing themselves but on the other hand strivalism seeks to keep the the best of the best and to prop up the best of the best not necessarily to only keep the best but to it's a constant to ref be the best. right it's a constant it's a refining of the self and yeah. of the species this is kind of that balance this is where individualism really gets kicked out of the way of strivalism because it's now no longer about what you want or need, but it's mm -hmm. like the needs of the species. And that's a very, <laughs> it's a very dangerous game to it, play. It is. Um, we, we need to survive. Humans need to survive. I, I, that I, is not an emotional idea that is what I've discovered from understanding the biological imperative. Right. That is what single-celled organisms do. That is what all life on Earth has always tried to do. 99.9% .9 of the time, it fails at it. Mm -hmm. Why should we? We have this amazing, extraordinary capability of rationality, mm -hmm. and we're not using it. Mm -hmm. Like we, I mean, we should have already had colonies on other planets to perpetuate the species and to grow and to continue to push our boundaries. But what did we lack? We motivation. lacked Well, we lacked motivation and and self-discipline. Right. We lacked the refining of the individual because a lot of times I feel that people were sacrificing themselves to the state which just so happened to be led by other people. Hmm. Right? And so really they were giving their power up to another person. They weren't giving their power up to say the species. And I'm not sure if strivalism will eventually lead to a monarchy or if it would lead to a 
anarchy in the sense that there just is no government. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't am, know where that I am just a simple guy thinking <laughs> about things that maybe I have no business thinking about. I only plan on writing the foundations, and I hope that if somebody were to pick up this philosophy and truly refine themselves according to it in its entirety, that they would then begin to have an idea of what the next layer over the foundation would be. Right. What the first pillar would look like. And it's a very it's a very human thing for us to get ahead of ourselves where we come up with an idea and we it's difficult to come to terms with there is it's really hard to make an idea apply to everything all at once with no holes. So when you can have an idea it is the necessity of others to help refine and sharpen it right and so we bring up these points because we were talking about we believe that democracy is truly falling we believe that the political systems that exist right now in the west are failing and they are going to spiral out of control and so what the purpose of strivalism is is to bring about a foundational philosophy that hopefully people would pick up on and be able to build up new metaphysical infrastructures for people to exist within um, and on top of um, in future generations. But we are, I am particularly for sure that democracy is at its end. It's in in this, in this cycle, it's at its end. Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga. Um, how are we on time, by the way? That's We're at 216 right now. So, um, we should wrap up. yeah, I'm going to end with. Life is about survival. Your entire existence came about by generation after generation of people and the, the more animal life before us struggling to survive. And. For you to not do so, regardless of your dispositions in life, is is shitting on those struggles. (laughs) And really, I just want to build a philosophy that encourages people to continue on not for their own sake, but for the sake of everyone. And I might be encroaching in a very dangerous philosophy where forcing someone to sacrifice their own individual wants becomes the norm. That's not something I want to do. I'm not trying to bring about a utopia. I welcome struggle because that's how we grow. That's the whole... That's the whole goal of strivalism, the strata. Yeah. All right. I, I, good was, show. That was, that was a jolly good show. <laughs> More coming very soon. <laughs> <laughs>